my pleasure to introduce uh, John Presco, who will be talking to us about uh, realistic noise as opposed to, I guess, uh, unrealistic noise, which is what I usually generate. Well, me too. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about fault tolerance. I think most of us recognize that error correction and fault tolerance will be essential for the operation of large-scale quantum computers, both to prevent decoherence and also to control the cumulative effects of small errors in unitary quantum gates. And I'm going to be focusing in my talk on fault tolerant processing using quantum error correcting codes. Of course, there are a lot of other useful ideas for protecting quantum computers against noise, which we're hearing about at this meeting, like dynamical decoupling and noiseless subsystems and so on. But the attitude I'm going to take is that after you've exhausted uh, all the tricks that uh, you can achieve with clever pulse sequences and so on, there will still be some residual noise which we'll have to control using quantum error correcting codes to suppress the noise further. So I'll make some preliminary comments about fault tolerant quantum computing and the accuracy threshold theorem. And then I want to talk about two main topics. One is whether we can take advantage in fault tolerant constructions of the feature in many hardware settings that the noise is dominated by dephasing based on a recent paper with Panos Oliferis. And the other is what can we say about how effectively we can protect quantum computers against realistic noise models, including non-Markovian effects that can be derived from first principles. Now the issue of fault tolerance arises because while we know quantum error correcting codes can protect quantum information in principle, in practice the quantum gates that we use to encode and to recover from errors are themselves noisy. So if we measure an error syndrome, for example, we might get the wrong answer. Errors might propagate badly during our procedures like syndrome extraction. And of course we're going to have to have a way of implementing a universal set of quantum gates that acts on the encoded states without unacceptable error propagation. And we'll need codes that can correct many errors in a block if we're going to successfully execute a long computation. So consider, for example, the problem of protecting a quantum state in a quantum memory using repeated quantum error correction. Let's say we're, we have error correction gadgets that are based on a code that can correct one error. So what that means is that if we perform our error correction procedure perfectly without any faults, if we have an input state in our block which has one error, then the error correction will produce an output without any errors. But for fault tolerance, we want an additional property. We want, we want it to be the case that if the input has no errors and in our error correction gadget there's one faulty gate, there will be at most one error in the output block. And if we constru can construct such an error correction gadget, then we'll be able to protect our quantum state in the quantum memory as long as we never have two or more faults in a pair of consecutive error corrections. Because if that doesn't happen, then every time a fault occurs which introduces an error, we'll be able to correct the error before it's joined by a second error which would cause an encoded failure for this code that can protect against only one error. Well, similarly, we would like the gadgets that perform our encoded gates to be fault tolerant in this sense, that when we perform them flawlessly, if there's an error in the input to the gate, there will be at most one error in each output block. And on the other hand, if the input has no errors and the gate has one fault, we want to have no more than one error in each output block. So if that's the case, then if we consider simulating a circuit by performing an error correction after every encoded quantum gate, our simulation will be successful as long as each one of these extended rectangles that contains the gate and the error correction that immediately precedes it and the error correction that immediately follows, if each one of those extended rectangles has no more than one fault, then our simulation uh, will be successful because we'll always be able to uh, correct an error introduced by a fault before it's joined by a second error to cause an encoded failure. So what that means is that if we use these properly designed fault tolerant gadgets to simulate a quantum circuit, because it takes two faults to cause failure in one of these extended rectangles, if we imagine, say, that the faults occur independently at each circuit location with some probability epsilon, then the probability of failure is going to be of order epsilon squared since it takes two independent faults to um, cause failure. 
it'll scale with the number of simulated gates, and there will be some combinatoric factor counting the number of ways in which a pair of faults can cause things to go badly. So what that means is if epsilon is small enough, we'll be able to perform a computation longer for a time of order 1 over epsilon squared instead of 1 over epsilon with a reasonable success probability. Of course, we'd like to go further and suppress the probability of failure more than just from epsilon to epsilon squared. And one way of doing that is with the idea of a recursive simulation, a hierarchy of error correction gadgets within gadgets. If we think of the construction I described so far this way, that we have some gate that we want to simulate, and we replace it by a level one rectangle, that means a gadget which performs the encoded operation on the code space, followed by error corrections on the output blocks. We can imagine repeating that procedure. We can obtain a level two rectangle by replacing each gate in the one rectangle by a one rectangle, and a level three rectangle by replacing each gate in the one rectangle by a two rectangle, and so on. And the advantage of doing so is that if the noise is weak enough, then as we go to higher and higher levels of this encoded hierarchy, we'll be able to suppress the noise more and more effectively. So if we want to analyze this type of recursive simulation, uh, there's a method for doing that, which which I won't explain in, in, in detail because the idea is actually pretty simple, and that is that our extended rectangles are going to do what they're supposed to do as long as there isn't two or more faults inside an extended rectangle. And so there's a procedure for mapping a level one computation to a level zero computation, a kind of coarse graining of the computation. The resulting level zero computation is exactly equivalent to the level one computation that we started with as far as the way it acts on the encoded information. And in that procedure, for each extended rectangle that has no more than one fault, the corresponding gate gets mapped to the ideal gate. And if there are two or more faults, it gets mapped to some noisy gate. That's the procedure that I call level reduction. And the noise model, after we do the level reduction, will be different than before. It'll be some kind of renormalized noise model. We'd like to have a noise model such that we can perform this procedure repeatedly, which requires that the noise model have nice stability properties under level reduction. And a noise model that behaves that way is what we call local stochastic noise. We imagine taking our noisy circuit and expanding it as a sum of fault paths, where each fault path designates certain gates in the circuit as faulty and assumes that the rest are ideal. Each one of the fault paths is assigned to probability. And when we speak of local stochastic noise with strength epsilon, what we mean is we can pick any R locations in this big circuit. And if we sum up the probabilities of all of the fault paths such that each one of those specified gates has a fault, the probability is at most epsilon to the r, and then we call epsilon the strength of the noise. So this type of noise model allows correlations in the noise, both spatial and temporal. And in fact, where the uh, faults occur, we assume that the operations are arbitrary and could be chosen adversarially. But it's local in the sense that each fault costs a, a power of epsilon. And so that means that when we renormalize the noise, because it takes two faults, to cause failure of one of our level one gadgets, the new noise model has a strength which is of order epsilon squared. And if epsilon is small enough, it'll be smaller than uh, the bare noise model that we started with. And furthermore, the new noise model is still local stochastic noise. So we can run the argument over again, all together k times, to get a renormalized value of the noise, which can be much smaller than the noise that we started with. And that's how we get an accuracy threshold theorem. It says that if we have a circuit which is subject to this local stochastic noise model, and the strength of the noise is weak compared less than some uh, critical value, the accuracy threshold, then if I have some ideal circuit with L gates that I want to simulate to some fixed accuracy, I can do so with an overhead cost, which is not too bad, a blow up in the number of gates, which is a factor of a power of the log of the size of the circuit to be simulated. So we've known this result for over 10 years, but it's only fairly recently that we've had a rigorous um, lower bounds on the accuracy threshold, which are not really low. And the analysis that we did a couple of years ago for the concatenated 7-qubit code gave a, gave a value which was uh, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 5. 
as Daniel emphasized in his talk on Monday, there are some uh, essential assumptions that go into the argument. We assume parallel operation. We assume that there's a supply of fresh qubits available that's needed to carry away the entropy introduced by the noise. And to get this number, in fact, I made some additional assumptions. I assume that I can perform a gate on any pair of qubits, no matter where they're located, that we can do fast measurements, and that there's no leakage from the Hilbert space. There's been a lot of progress in the theory in the last couple of years. So we've seen that if you consider gates which are strictly nearest neighbor gates in two dimensions, the threshold doesn't get much worse. We've seen that the fast measurements are not really essential. And there have been steady improvements in the value of the threshold estimates. It's known that if we use subsystem codes, we can do uh, better. Uh, an idea originally suggested by Knell, uh, post-selected simulation of a quantum circuit gives uh, an even, even higher threshold estimate. And recently, in uh, this work by Ala Ferris, it's been shown that that improvement in the threshold doesn't necessarily involve a uh, very substantial overhead cost. And we'll also hear tomorrow about interesting ideas about using topological protection cluster state computation. So the state of the art in rigorous threshold estimates uh, in this recent paper by Ala Ferris is a threshold of about 10 to the minus 3. So there are two things that I want to talk about now. Um, this local stochastic noise model that I've described so far describes a kind of generic type of noise, but the noise might have special structure and properties that we can exploit to do fault tolerance better. And also the local stochastic noise model, as uh, Alitsky said correctly yesterday, is really a phenomenological model. And we'd like to know how well fault tolerance works for noise models that can be better justified from the point of view of first principles. So let's talk about bias noise. There are a lot of physical settings in which dephasing is a lot stronger than relaxation, in which the Z noise is much stronger than the X noise, if you like. The dephasing arises from noise that has relatively low frequency. The relaxation is dominated by noise which has a frequency comparable to the energy splitting between our computational basis states. And that higher frequency noise comparable for relaxation uh, might have a much different physical origin than the low frequency noise, and it could be orders of magnitude weaker. So we'd like fault tolerant gadgets that can exploit this bias and tolerate a higher level of dephasing noise than we might have concluded if we considered the noise to be generic. So naturally, we should use a code that corrects more Z errors than X errors. But there's more to it than that. We have to be sure that our universal set of gadgets has the property that it won't propagate the Z errors, which occur relatively often, to the X errors that our code isn't very well equipped to correct. So we should avoid, for example, Hadamard gates, which could take a Z error and propagate it to an X error. Well, from this point of view, CNOT gates seem like they're not so bad because they don't propagate a Z to an X. And we could, under the assumption that the CNOT gates have highly biased noise, try to do a threshold of the estimate, and, and that's been done. But is it really reasonable to assume that a CNOT gate has highly biased noise? Well, if we think of how the gate is realized by some time-dependent control Hamiltonian that turns on and off, a Z error that occurs while a qubit is rotating on the block sphere can generate an X error. And for that matter, if I'm just considering doing a rotation about the X axis and I rotate a little bit too much or rotate uh, not quite enough, uh, that'll generate an X error. So it seems sensible to make a distinction between diagonal gates, that is, gates that are diagonal in the computational basis, can be written as such matrices, and non-diagonal gates. And it's reasonable to assume that the noise in diagonal gates is dominated by dephasing, while the noise in non-diagonal gates might not have any special structure. What's special about the diagonal gates is that we can realize them by turning on and off an, an ideal control Hamiltonian that at all times, so it won't propagate a Z error to an X error. So we can reformulate our uh, lo uh, local stochastic noise model incorporating bias. That is, we can distinguish between two different measures of the noise strength. Uh, strength epsilon, which quantifies the rate of faults which are either dephasing faults in our diagonal gates or faults without any special structure in other non-diagonal gates. And then a smaller noise strength epsilon prime, which characterize, 
characterizes the noise which is not dephasing noise in the diagonal gates. So those uh, unstructured faults with strength epsilon prime in um, the diagonal gates have arbitrary cross operators, whereas the dephasing faults have cross operators which are diagonal in the computational basis. So the noise model incorporates a bias factor, this ratio of epsilon prime over epsilon, which uh, we're taking to be small compared to one. Okay, so now what I want to do is build a fault tolerance scheme using as a fundamental gate the two qubit gate, which is a controlled phase gate, a controlled Z, and also single qubit preparations and single qubit measurements. So the C phase gate written in the computational basis is just the diagonal matrix with entries 1, 1, 1, minus 1. It's the same as the controlled phase gate that uh, Wineland passed yesterday up to some single qubit uh, gates which are also diagonal in the computational basis. And so what we'll do is we'll consider at the lowest level of a concatenated scheme an n qubit repetition code which provides some protection against defacing against the z errors but doesn't provide any protection against the x errors. And then we'll use our fundamental operations which are this C phase gate which we assume has bias noise and also the measurement and preparation of states in the X basis, which has noise with no special uh, properties, uh, we'll use those to construct a C naught gate, which is a C naught gate acting on the code space and which is fault tolerant. And that C naught gate will have noise which is approximately balanced with the X errors and the Z errors occurring at comparable rates. And then we'll plug that C naught gate into known fault tolerant schemes in order to get very reliable C naught gates at a high level of some concatenated scheme. And then for universality, we need one more thing, which is the ability to prepare a couple of other uh, states of single qubits, which can then be teleported into the code block and uh, distilled to give high fidelity versions of these additional uh, magic states, which can be used to complete the universal set of gates. OK, so let's just, for definiteness, consider the repetition code of length three, we might want to consider a longer code, but I can draw this easier. So I'm considering the code where the code space is spanned by products of X eigenstates, plus, 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 and minus, minus, minus. Um, those provide us with some protection against the Z errors. The Z errors can flip a plus and turn it into a minus, or a minus and turn it into a plus. But because of the redundant encoding, one Z error isn't going to cause an encoded failure. The code states are very easy to encode. I can make a plus state in the code space just by preparing a product state of three qubits, which are all in the plus state. And measurements are also easy. I can perform a measurement in the X basis on all three qubits and perform a majority vote on the outcomes to find the result of the measurement of an encoded X. And those are fault tolerant preparations measurements, a single faulty measurement or a single faulty preparation won't give rise to an, an encoded error. Well, there are also other things we'll want to do, like measure the encoded Z. That's a little trickier. The encoded Z is a uh, weight three operator, a tensor product of three Zs. And we know how to measure that. In principle, we can prepare an ancilla state in the state plus and then perform a sequence of three controlled phase gates and then measure the ancilla and that'll give us the result of the encoded Z, the ZZZ operator. But that's not fault tolerant because a single fault, a single Z error could flip the value of the ancilla and that would change the result of the measurement. To make it fault tolerant, we have to repeat that measurement. So we can repeat it three times and take the majority vote of the outcomes. And then it's fault tolerant in the sense that there's no way for a single fault in this measurement gadget to cause the outcome to be wrong. The way we'll do error correction in this scheme is by teleportation. But actually, things are simpler here because we only are trying to correct the Z errors at the bottom level of our concatenated scheme. So the error correction gadget can actually be based on one bit teleportation. That's this circuit where we prepare an ancilla qubit in the state plus, then perform a joint measurement of ZZ on the input state and the ancilla, and then uh, perform an X measurement on the ancilla. And if the outcome of both measurements is plus one, uh, in fact, the input gets mapped 
to the output, this is just the identity gate. And if some of these measurements uh, have the value minus one, then the output differs from the input by some known poly operator determined by the measurement. And we don't have to correct those poly errors. It's just enough to keep track of them. So this gadget is fault tolerant in the sense that if in the input I have, now let's imagine we're using an n qubit repetition code. And if in the input I have uh, m z errors, and there are s z faults in the gadget, then as long as m plus s is less than half the length of the code, then we'll be able to correct the errors successfully. Fault tolerance here means that we can tolerate z errors. We're not providing any protection against the x errors. Uh, one more thing that we need is a construction of a control not gate, which is also a teleported. And to realize the control not, we can prepare a couple of ancilla blocks in the state plus, and then we do four measurements, a measurement of ZZ, a measurement of ZZZ on three encoded qubits, and then two X measurements. And you can check that if the measurements all give the result plus one, the output differs from the input by a control not gate. The way you check that is you see that the poly operators X and Z acting on the input put qubits propagate through this circuit the way a control not propagates them with, say, xi on the uh, control in the target propagating to xx. And if some of the measurements have the value minus one, then the output differs from the result of applying the control not by um, known poly operators. So we've succeeded in constructing a fault tolerant encoded C not gate for our repetition code from just the fundamental ingredients controlled phase gates, preparations, and measurements. So how are we going to analyze how well a circuit constructed from these controlled not gates performs? Well, what we can consider is propagating the errors introduced by the faults forward in the circuit until they reach the X measurements. And we have a successful implementation of a CNOT gate, a successful gadget, as long as all of the measurements that are needed, the measurements of Z, 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 X, and X, uh, agree with the ideal case. They give the same outcomes that we would have obtained after we do our majority voting if there were no errors in the input and there were no faults in the circuit. Propagating the Z errors is extremely simple because Z commutes with everything. It commutes through the C phase gates, and so we can just move the uh, Z errors forward to the final measurements in the X basis. We don't have any protection against X errors, so whenever there's an unstructured fault, the thing goes kablooey, and we just assume that the gadget fails. So if I want to know uh, the probability of failure in my local stochastic bias noise model for, say, this X measurement, I go back to when this block was prepared, and I consider all the C phase gates that act on it in these three measurements that are performed on that block, and as long as the number of qubits that are damaged by the faults is less than half the length of the block, the measurement is going to be successful. So we can add up all the probabilities or upper bounds on all the probabilities of the failure modes for this scheme. That is the probability that any one of the measurements differs from the ideal case. We have four measurements to consider, the two different X measurements, the measurement of ZZ and the measurement of ZZZ, all the ingredients we need for our teleported C not gate. And then there's one last failure mode, which is in some C phase gate, there's a relatively rare uh, fault without any special structure that we're not protected against. And so we can ask for um, a given epsilon and epsilon prime defining the noise model. Is our encoded C not gate, does it have an effective fault rate below the uh, threshold value of 10 to the minus 3 um, established previously for noise without any special structure? Actually, there's one more idea that gives us a better result which is in each one of these measurements, we have majority voting um, for both our X measurements and our measurements of products of Zs. And an encoded error is more likely to fail if the vote is close, if the majority just barely wins. So for example, consider the case of block size five, which actually is going to turn out to be the optimal length of the code. Um, if there's a three to two vote, then it's possible that just three faults cause the failure of the measurement. But if the majority vote is four to one, 
then it would actually take four faults for the majority to be wrong. So we can flag, keep a record of which votes were close, and we can use that information at the next level up in a concatenated scheme to improve the reliability of the decoding at the next level up. So that's another idea which helps us improve our threshold estimate for uh, this model. And so what we find is that we can get CMOT gates which are reliable at the top level, which have arbitrarily uh, weak noise, if the uh, dephasing faults in the C phase gates occur at a rate which is uh, less than 5 times 10 to the minus 3. And then there's one more ingredient in the threshold analysis which I'm not really explaining, but we have to analyze the uh, injection by teleportation of the additional states used for uh, universality and the distillation of those states and make sure that works. But when we consider that, the threshold goes down by a little bit. So we have an estimate for the rate of dephasing faults in our fundamental controlled phase gates, which is better by about a factor of five than in the analysis, which assumes the noise has no special structure. So this is a nice illustration of how we can improve the performance of fault tolerance if we know something about the noise. And perhaps just as important, it shows that just a fundamental C phase two cupid gate along with preparations and measurements are sufficient to construct a universal fault tolerant scheme and that may be good news from the point of view of some hardware implementations. That's a theme that uh, Oliferis will pick up in his talk later this morning. Okay, so now I want to go on to another topic which is what can we say about noise models which are better motivated than the noise model I've described so far from the point of view of first principles. So in the local stochastic noise model, uh, this phenomenological model, maybe it's not a bad caricature of the noise in actual quantum computers, but it does make the assumption that the different fault paths can be assigned probabilities. In other words, it assumes that the different fault paths decohere, and that might not be the case. It might be more appropriate to assign amplitudes instead of probabilities to the fault paths. And what we can do uh, if we're not going to assume that the fault paths decohere is we can take the unitary operator acting on the system and its environment, the complete dynamics of the system and the bath, and we can perform a fault path expansion on that. We can consider this uh, unitary, because it describes the whole world, the computer and the environment, uh, acting on the initial state of the system of the bath, and we can expand that into uh, fault paths. And now we can ask if we look at the piece in this expansion where there are faults in each one of our um, locations in the circuit, specified gates in the circuit, if the norm of the contribution to this uh, system bath state which is faulty at those R locations is less than epsilon to the R, then we can say we have a local noise model, not really a stochastic one, uh, but a local noise model with strength epsilon. Now, from a physics perspective, it's more natural to formulate the noise model in a Hamiltonian language in terms of a Hamiltonian that couples the system to the environment, so we can write the Hamiltonian as a sum of three pieces. The ideal time-dependent Hamiltonian that would realize the quantum computation that we're trying to perform, some Hamiltonian that describes the dynamics of the bath, the environment, and some coupling between the two. And I'm actually including in what I'm calling H-system bath any unitary control errors that cause the system Hamiltonian to deviate from the uh, ideal one. And now, we have a noise model which we can think of as local. If the system bath coupling can be expanded in terms of terms, each of which acts on just a few qubits, though it might act on the bath in some uh, arbitrary complicated way. So we might, for example, consider a model in which it's a sum of terms where uh, each term acts on the qubits which are undergoing a gate at a particular time. And then what we can show is that this model can be described by a local noise model where the parameter epsilon is determined by the norm of these local terms in the system bath Hamiltonian. We can take as our strength of the noise the time it takes to perform a gate, the working period of uh, a single quantum gate, times a uh, bound on the norm of the system bath Hamiltonian, its maximum over all times that we're considering the evolution, 
and all the locations in the circuit. And the idea is pretty clear that if we do a perturbation expansion in H system bath, uh, if we don't insert the perturbation in a particular location, then we can take it to be ideal. If we insert the perturbation um, one or more times, uh, then it could be faulty. So if we're going to have our locations, which are all faulty, well, we're going to have to insert the perturbation in each one of those R locations. And we can actually show the argument's a little different than for the stochastic noise model, but the idea is very much the same. That if the noise in this local noise model is weak enough, then fault tolerant computing will work. If we build a concatenated scheme, we need insertions of the perturbations which cluster together in a very unlikely way for the scheme to fail. So there is a threshold value of the noise strength, which is something like 10 to the minus 4. So what that shows is that quantum error correction works as long as the coupling of the system to the bath is local and weak. We don't need to assume anything about the bath dynamics. The noise could be correlated in complicated ways. There could be memory effects, but what makes it work is the weak coupling between the system and the bath and the fact that the coupling is local, only acts on a few system qubits at a time. But there are disadvantages to formulating our threshold condition in terms of the norm of the Hamiltonian coupling the system to the bath. Well, actually, there are two disadvantages, and I'm really only going to talk from now on about the second one, but I'll mention the first. The first is that our condition is really a condition on an amplitude instead of a probability. We're requiring an amplitude to be small. So requiring an amplitude to be less than 10 to the minus 4 is really like uh, saying a probability is less than 10 to the minus 8. So that sounds very pessimistic, and the reason we're getting this pessimistic conclusion is that we're allowing all the different fault paths to add together constructively, uh, which seems very unlikely. Under some plausible randomization hypothesis in which the phases of the fault paths add in a quasi-random way, it would make sense to think about adding probabilities instead of adding amplitudes. But it's actually not so obvious what assumptions we should make about our noise model to justify a rigorous argument that incorporates that randomization, that excludes the possibility of constructive interference of the fault paths. But there's another reason why this uh, condition is perhaps uh, not all we would hope for. One is that the norm of the coupling of the system of the bath is not something that experimentalists measure. It's not something we know about directly from experiments. And it may be that some noise models, which seem like a plausible description of the noise, actually have the property that the system bath coupling has infinite norm. For example, we might want to model the noise by coupling the system qubits to a bath of harmonic oscillators, and the oscillator variables actually have infinite operator norm. So the derivation of this norm condition, this threshold condition, does have the big advantage that it doesn't require any assumption about the bath Hamiltonian or about the state of the bath. There is one important thing that maybe I should say, and that is we're, we're modeling qubit preparations and measurements in a particular way. I'm modeling preparations, for example, by an ideal preparation followed by coupling of the system to the bath. Um, but for the most part, we don't need to know much about the state of the bath or about the dynamics of the bath for this argument. But it has a disadvantage, and f from a physical point of view, I think the way to characterize the disadvantage is that we're demanding that, this is another way of saying that the norm could be very large, we're demanding that the very high frequency fluctuations of the bath uh, be highly suppressed in order for fault tolerance to work. And intuitively, it doesn't seem like that should really be necessary. If we have noise which has high frequency but which has mean zero, we should expect it to average out over the time it takes to execute a gate with some slowly varying time-dependent Hamiltonian, slowly varying on the scale of the fluctuations of the bath. But maybe we shouldn't be too, too quick to dismiss the possibility that the high frequency fluctuations or the large norm of the bath operators could be a problem. Um, it's conceivable that in the course of a long computation, a state of the environment which initially seems benign will be driven to a new state that inflicts worse damage on the system than we might naively expect, what I refer to as Alitsky's nightmare. So we'd like to address whether uh, we can say something about whether this nightmare can actually occur. Well, if we're going to go further, uh, then this argument, we're going to have to make 
additional assumptions about the noise. We're going to have to consider more restricted noise models. And if we do so, we can, in some cases, formulate a threshold condition, uh, which from a physical point of view seems more palatable. It can be stated in terms of the power spectrum of the bath fluctuations, and it will place less stringent constraints on the high frequency fluctuations of the bath than this condition on the operator norm. So what I'll consider from now on is the case where each qubit couples to a bath of harmonic oscillators. And our task is to get an estimate of the strength of the noise that we are to plug in to previous threshold arguments. The strength of the noise is uh, determined by the norm of the bad part of the system bath state, where the bad part means, uh, if we're considering our specified locations in the circuit, the part where all are of those locations deviate from the ideal case. All of them have faults. So this is the model. Let's just jump in and look at the model. It's the same model Novais was talking about yesterday. I have a system of uncoupled oscillators, and I have a system bath Hamiltonian in which some linear combination of these oscillator variables uh, couples to each component of the spin at each spatial location. Alpha is the spin component, X is the location, and I threw in a coupling constant as well. And now we can consider in this model the expectation value in the bath's ground state, where all the oscillators are in their ground state, of a product of bath operators. The time dependence arises here because I'm thinking of these as interaction picture operators. That is, I'm imagining that the uh, time evolution uh, before and after the insertion of the operator is determined by this free bath Hamiltonian. Uh, that's what it means to be in the interaction picture. And I can take that expectation value and by approximating this sum over all the oscillator modes by an integral over frequencies, I can write its Fourier transform in terms of this quantity, which is what I mean by the noise power spectrum. Um, it has some dependence on the frequency omega, the positions of the qubits, and the spin components of the qubits. Now, I call this a Gaussian noise model, and what that means is that the fluctuations of the bath obey Gaussian statistics. That is, all the higher point correlation functions are determined by the two-point correlators. Um, so, for example, if I consider the expectation value of a product of four bath operators, I can expand it um, as a sum of all the ways of pairing up um, the bath operators, and for each pairing, I consider a product of the corresponding two-point functions. And that kind of expansion will work uh, not just for the case where the um, we're in the vacuum of the bath initially, but where the bath has a thermal state initially. So similarly, if I have two N uh, bath operators, I can expand the expectation value in terms of a sum over all contractions, all the ways of choosing pairs two at a time, and then um, for each term in the sum, I have a product of two-point correlation functions. Okay, so our task is to figure out what the norm of the bad part is, okay? So let's consider the case where we mark one location and we want to find the norm squared of the contribution in which both of these locations are faulty. So that means both of them have at least one insertion of the perturbation, okay? So we consider evolving the system forward in time up until right before the final measurements at the end of the circuit, and then we evolve it backward in time, and we have on the left, again, the initial state of the system and the bath. And it's convenient to take this kind of diagram and bend it into a hairpin shape so that uh, time is running in the same direction from right to left on both the upper and the lower branch, so the times line up between the two branches. But the operator ordering is such that all the operators that are inserted on the lower branch are are applied after the operators on the upper branch. Okay, so now we imagine making an expansion to all orders of the system bath evolution operator in powers of the perturbation that couples the system to the bath. And for any first fixed uh, term in that expansion, the system and the bath are uncoupled in between the insertions of the perturbation. So the system is just evolving ideally in between the insertions, and the bath is just evolving according to its a free Hamiltonian. So that's what we mean by interaction picture perturbation theory. And now, tracing out the means evaluating the expectation value in the initial state of the bath of some string 
of bath operators, and for that we can use the Gaussian statistics. So we consider some term which has many insertions of the perturbation, and then we have to sum over all the ways of contracting pairs of insertions, and for each one of those we have a two-point correlation function, and uh, then we have to sum over all the ways of doing the insertions, and that gives the full system bath evolution. We don't want the full thing. We want the contribution which is bad at the marked location. So we want to have at least one insertion of the perturbation at the marked location, both on the upper branch and on the lower branch. And we want to sum up all those diagrams to get an estimate of the strength of the noise. OK. So in some special cases, you can do this sum exactly. Um, but in general, you can't. So what we need to do is get an upper bound on the sum to get an estimate of the strength of the noise. And there's a method for doing that. Uh, which is really a variant of a method that was used in, in these earlier papers which studied quantum computing and non-Markovian noise. So what we can do is suppose that we fix the earliest time on both branches where the perturbation is inserted. We're going to sum over that later, but fix it for now. And um, when we, since we have here one mark location on the upper branch and one mark location on the lower branch, we can execute uh, we can consider two possibilities. Those first insertions could be contracted with one another in our expansion over all powers of the perturbations and all ways of contracting. Or each one could be contracted with another insertion of the perturbation somewhere else. And so we look at either one of these cases, let's say this one, and now we're supposed to dress those diagrams up with all the other ways of inserting the perturbation and all the other ways of doing the contractions. Okay? And we do that for this diagram too, and then we have to sum over all the positions where the first insertion occurred, and then we have our estimate of the bad part of the norm squared for the system bath state. That's the strength of the noise. So there's a nice way of doing a resummation of all the diagrams and all the insertions and all the contractions, which is to, when we fix the first insertion on both branches, we can think of elsewhere in the circuit the dynamics being determined by what we could call a hybrid Hamiltonian. It has the property that the coupling between the system and the bath is turned off in this exclusive region. That's because we're not allowed to insert a perturbation there because this was um, fixed to be the first insertion of the perturbation. Okay? So if we turn off the system bath Hamiltonian in the excluded region, but we leave it on everywhere else, and we expand that, we get all the ways of inserting the perturbation and all the ways of contracting them, but we don't do any illegal ins insertions that go before the first insertion in the excluded region. And so what happens is this. We wind up after we uh, integrate over where the first insertion is with an integral on both branches over the marked location, and then we have our two-point correlation function. I'm considering the case in which these two guys are contracted with one another and their coupling constants, and then we have the expectation value in the initial state of the system of a product of system poly operators, and these are evaluated in this hybrid picture. They're not interaction picture or, or Heisenberg picture operators. They're hybrid picture operators, and that means this is actually the exact answer. I don't, in general, know how to evaluate this expectation value in the hybrid picture. It's easy to get a bound, though, because these are operators with norm 1. So I can bound the absolute value of this integral by bounding this by 1, and then I just have an integral of an absolute value of a two-point function for the bath fluctuations, and I integrate each leg over the marked location, one on the upper branch and one on the lower branch. We're not done because we also have this other case where the first insertion is contracted with an insertion somewhere else. So in this case, um, we can consider fixing the first insertion in each branch and also what it's contracted with, and then sum over everything else using this, this hybrid picture trick. And we can bound the system part by one again. And then we get an absolute value of a product of correlation functions. And then what we have to do is integrate one leg over the marked location at the upper branch, uh, this leg over the marked location on the lower branch, and then the other guy, he gets integrated over everything, any time, any qubit, okay? Because all of those things contribute to the badness of the marked location. Oh yeah, but we have to consider not just one marked location, we have to consider many marked locations. So this is, I drew the case for R equals two, 
And we have to sum up all the possibilities when we consider the first insertion of the perturbation at the mark location on the upper branch and on the lower branch. Those guys can be contracted with one another. There are three ways of doing that. Or we can contract two of them and can then contract the others with uh, an insertion somewhere else. Or we can contract all of them with insertions somewhere else. And we have to get a bound on the sum of all these things. But actually, we solved a very similar problem in this paper with the Hanoff and Kataev a couple of years ago. And we can use pretty much the same argument to do it here. And we wind up with an estimate of the uh, noise strength, the quantity that I called epsilon squared that quantifies the strength in the uh, local noise model. I can write this way and bound it. I mean, this isn't you know an, an uh, upper bound on the noise strength. Uh, as I look at the two-point correlation function, I integrate one of its legs over a marked location. I integrate the other one over everything, which means all times and all qubits. And then there's some uh, constant of order one that comes in from all the combinatorics of bounding the sums of diagrams, but it's, but it's nothing too bad. And so it's the square root of this quantity, which is epsilon, which we're requiring to be small uh, in order for fault tolerance to work, where small means less than something like 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so what, uh, what do we conclude from this condition? We now have a condition that um, applies to a Gaussian noise model in a pretty general setting. So one thing we can ask is, uh, does it, what's the condition for this thing to converge? So we really have a, a finite quantity that we're requiring to be small in the limit of a very large computation. And so we get a condition which is exactly the one that Novice wrote down yesterday. Uh, we can express it in terms of the scale dimension of the bath operators, which determines how their correlation functions fall off with distance at a uh, large distance, and in terms of a dynamical exponent, which determines how they fall off in time. And in order for this expression to be convergent, we need the spatial dimension plus the dynamical ex exponent to be less than twice the scale dimension. Now, I seem to be getting this for not exactly the same reason that Novice is. Um, it, because I'm not directly using the idea that he used, which is that different fault paths which give rise to different syndrome histories shouldn't interfere uh, with one another. But uh, both of us, for different reasons, are insisting that there's an insertion of the perturbation at the marked location on both branches. And I, think, I guess that's why we're getting the same result. I'm doing it because I'm requiring the norm squared of the bad part to be small, so I have the bad part on both the right and its adjoint on the left. So I have insertions of the perturbation on both branches. So we can also ask what we get in the Markovian limit. That's the case in which the correlation function is a delta function, or it's anyway a very narrow peaked function. And what happens then is that uh, in the Markovian model, there's a rate uh, for faults gamma, so the probability of a fault in a gate which takes time t to execute goes like gamma t. But actually, the quantity epsilon that we're requiring to be small isn't gamma t. It's the square root of gamma t. That's because although in the Markovian case, the different fault paths really do decohere with one another, this general argument isn't clever enough to exploit that. So it's requiring an amplitude which goes like a square root of a probability to be small rather than a probability. So you can think of this as the result that applies in what you might call high temperature ohmic noise, by which I mean that um, the frequency at the cutoff is still small compared to the temperature. So that's the case in which the noise power spectrum is flat up to a cutoff. That cutoff determines the, um, the width of this approximation to a delta function, and, and one over the cutoff time determines the height. So when, uh, when you integrate, you get something that doesn't depend on the cutoff. But if we use the norm condition, we'd really be saying that we're requiring the height of the peak to be sufficiently small. We got rid of that sensitivity to the cutoff by uh, using this argument that applies for Gaussian noise. Now, what about the case of zero temperature ohmic noise? Uh, so what that case means that the... Uh, in, free, in the frequency domain, the power spectrum is increasing linearly until you get to a cutoff value, which is determined by this uh, small cutoff time. So in real time, it looks like this. The um, dependence on time actually has wiggles on it, or it has peaks and wiggles, uh, which have a characteristic width, which goes like this cutoff time. Uh, but these both integrate to zero. That's uh, just a way of saying that the Fourier transform in the frequency domain is zero at zero frequency. So these wiggles integrate away. 
But unfortunately, our argument doesn't take advantage of uh, the fact that the wiggles uh, integrate away because it requires us to take the absolute value of the correlation function. And uh, so that actually, well, it looks kind of like the picture I drew before, but it's actually worse because while the width of the peak goes like the cutoff time, the height of the peak here goes like one over the cutoff time squared. Okay? So when we integrate the thing, we don't lose all the sensitivity to the cutoff. Um, what we get for epsilon squared is something that's proportional to one power of one over the cutoff. Um, if we use the norm condition, things would be even worse. Because for, uh, for epsilon squared, we'd be considering the height of the peak, which is two power one over the cutoff. We made things a little bit better by considering this integrated condition on the two-point function, but we haven't completely removed the dependence on the cutoff. So we see that in some cases, like this high temperature ohmic noise model, our new threshold condition, which applies to the special case of Gaussian noise, uh, avoids having any artificial sensitivity to the very high frequency fluctuations of the bath, which is good. But there are other cases like zero temperature ohmic noise where um, there's some sensitivity to the cutoff that remains. Things are better than when we use the operator norm condition, which we can think of as uh, requiring the height of that peak to be small because we get the advantage of integrating over a very narrow peak. Uh, but there's still sensitivity to the cutoff that remains. Now. Um, it could well be that this weak dependence on, well, it's not that weak, but weaker than before dependence on uh, the cutoff is still spurious. It doesn't seem quite right. It seems like we ought to be able, since we're kind of integrating this um, hybrid picture operator, uh, which we hope is varying smoothly in time against the correlation function, it shouldn't be so sensitive to the cutoff. But there's only one case in which I've been able to prove a, a better result, which is the case of diagonal noise that I talked about in the first uh, half of the talk. In the diagonal noise model where we have dephasing noise, and let's say only dephasing noise, um, then things are much easier because the faults commute with the gates, and I can commute them all through to the measurements, like I said earlier, and it's possible to sum up all the diagrams exactly. And in that case, I only get logarithmic dependence to the cutoff, the same kind of logarithmic sensitivity that Novais talked about yesterday. And even that logarithm maybe doesn't have to be there. I think it might have to do with the way I'm modeling the measurements by doing a sudden measurement uh, at a certain time after the system's been interacting with the bath. Um, Okay. All right, so um, I'm more, I'm, I was out of time a while ago, or I'm, okay. Um, well, that's right, because I'm done. So I told you about two main things. One is that we can improve the threshold esti estimate by exploiting the structure of the noise in, in some cases. And what we saw explicitly is that diagonal two qubit gates which we could plausibly expect to have highly biased noise to be dominated by dephasing, along with just single qubit preparations and measurements are enough to build a universal fault-tolerant quantum computing scheme. And then uh, the result that's been known for a while about non-Markovian noise expresses a condition in terms of the norm of the system bath Hamiltonian, and there are several reasons why we'd like to get a better threshold condition. For one, that seems to place uh, unphysically severe constraints on the very high frequency behavior of the noise. And in the special case of uh, Gaussian non-Markovian noise, we, we can get a better result, which is less frequency to the, less sensitive to the high frequency noise. Um, and there's a case in which I know the condition can be improved further, so it becomes quite insensitive to very high frequencies. And, but I don't know how to prove that in other cases. So I'm not sure whether, I suspect this is just a mathematical technicality, but until we have better arguments, we can't really be sure that this sensitivity to the high frequency noise isn't a signal that there's some kind of obstacle to large scale fault tolerance. That is, we can't still, uh, with uh, high confidence, exclude a Litsky's nightmare. Uh, okay, thanks for listening. Well, let's see. Here. Um, I noticed that you call out five alpha numbers of systems in the charge of Yeah. 
was just that came from our calculation. So the the thing is, if if we uh, use a longer repetition code uh, to realize our C not gate, then of course we have a bigger gadget. It has more locations, and so if we have a certain rate of defasing faults, um, will it turns out it's actually not so obvious, but it turns out that if the if the code is is long, uh, we get too many uh, defacing faults to be able to correct uh, with as low a probability of an encoded error as occurs when the length is five. So that just came out from from optimizing the code length in our estimate of the uh, fault rate for the encoded CNON. Yeah. I missed a little of that. You said you asked whether what are affected by different types of noise. The uh, different terms in this proposition at the application level are they affected differently by different types of noise? Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, but uh, I, ha I mean, I haven't analyzed that kind of thing in in detail because I've been trying just to understand how to get general arguments that would apply to you know uh, arbitrary uh, circuits and a noise model that I can characterize in some kind of general way. Yeah. I'm curious whether uh, at the application level we talk about the overall runtime of, of an algorithm and say, at this point it's, it's pretty stable and then later during the system with a highly sensitive part of the portion of the algorithm later is more stable. So I guess you're saying, so you're, you're suggesting a different attitude to the one I was taking. My attitude was we start by saying here's some circuit we want to do. And uh, then we ask, how well does it work? And you're saying, once I know a lot about the noise model, maybe I can adapt the algorithm to take advantage of the properties of the noise model. And of course, yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't analyzed that. But uh, I guess I'm not very optimistic about getting a lot of gas out of that strategy. Yeah. No, the uh, preparations and the and the measurements have um, have arbitrary faults in that analysis, and they occur with the same probability epsilon as the uh, as the defasing errors in the controlled phase gates. Yeah. Well, I suppose it would. I mean, you're saying I showed you the error correction gadget and it was simpler than the C naught. And so if I just wanted to do error correction, um, it would, uh, I'd be able to tolerate more noise. I haven't actually calculated that, but yeah, it would be a higher threshold. Okay, let's uh, thank John one more time.